Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Charlene Springer, and I am the Awareness and Prevention Education Student Programmer at SCC. I work in student activities and provide support and delivery of programming and educational initiatives to college faculty, staff, and students to support awareness education and personal development in areas such as sexual misconduct, alcohol and drug use, um, students' rights and responsibilities, and general well-being. Um, welcome to um, our Consent Cafe. Uh, we're going to do a few different things. We're going to take a consent quiz. Um, and just so that you know, we are giving away some prize packs. So stay tuned for some information on that. Um, first off, just so that, just to give you a little bit of background, um, April 20, or this April 2020 marks the 19th anniversary of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month is an annual campaign that raises public awareness and provides education and resources to communities and individuals about how to prevent sexual violence. SCC is standing up and speaking out against sexual assault. And today, as part of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we're going to discuss the impact and power of consent in our day-to-day -day life and relationships. So I also want to um, or let Shannon introduce herself. She's co-hosting with me today, so I will hand this over to her. All right, thank you so much, Charlene. Um, so my name is Shannon Ketchum. I am the Manager of Student Programs at Spokane Community College. I oversee awareness and prevention education programming at SCC, and I'm also a certified Title IX investigator, which means that I receive and investigate complaints of sexual misconduct, uh, sexual harassment, gender-related violence, including stalking and intimate partner violence, and protected class discrimination and harassment and related retaliation. Um, we certainly are excited that you uh, chose to join us today. We really want today's conversation to be a learning opportunity for the campus community and really to remain respectful and support the spirit of prevention education um, and understanding the importance of discussion on these topics in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, as a disclaimer, we also want to recognize that today's topics uh, may be sensitive difficult and maybe triggering for survivors and victims of sexual and relationship violence. So we do want to provide some information towards the end of today's conversation regarding campus and community resources for support and advocacy. Perfect. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and so this is actually um, supposed to be interactive and it's, you know, kind of like a roundtable discussion, which is what we're trying to do today. Um, it's a little bit different now that everything that we're doing is virtual. So you have a few options if you want to interject in conversation. Um, you, there's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you will be able to enter some dialogue um, in order to uh, participate in conversation. Or you can always just unmute yourself um, and you can speak with us directly that way, whichever you're comfortable with. Um, if you would, if we could, I would like to actually um, have you introduce yourself. Um, it's just so that, like I said, this is more of, you know, an interactive conversation, roundtable conversation. So if you could just, you know, um, unmute yourself or, you know, go into the chat and just say who you are. And if you're a student or um, part of faculty at SCC, just give us a heads up and let us know um, if you're faculty or student, that would be great. Hello everyone, I'm Norma Cantu. I'm with Career Services at Spokane Community College. Hi Norma, welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm Rhonda Allen. I work in Head Start at one of the off-campus off sites, but real close to the falls. So I'm a family service coordinator, so they're a social worker. Wonderful, thank you, Rhonda, welcome. I'm Kate Rebert, I work at the Testing Center at the Falls. Thank you, Kate, welcome. And this is Conan Campbell, I work in Student Services at SEC. Hello, Conan, thank you, welcome. 
Um, we were going to, this was supposed to be more of a cafe type style, like we were sitting together having coffee. Um, so like I said, we had to change our agenda just a little bit. So what we're going to start with is an interactive quiz just to see how much we all know about consent. So I'm going to share my screen with you here. Can everyone see that okay? You can give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Okay, so you can either unmute yourself and answer the question or in the chat box, you can go ahead and reply. First question is, um, you should ask for consent before hand holding, kissing, having sex or all of the above. Have all of the above. Okay. So all of the above, that is correct. You should always ask before any type of touch and before escalating things. Nice job. Consent is about more than getting a yes or no answer. It's about opening up a conversation with your partner about what you both want. Would this be true or false, do you think? Got true, true. Looks like everybody's saying true. Let's see what happens here. That is correct. These conversations show your partner that you respect them and won't make them do anything that they don't want to do. When should you ask for consent? When you feel like the moment is right, before any type of touch, only right before sex, or just the first time you have sex with someone? Looks like before any type of touch is the consensus. And that is correct. You should always think about how your actions might make someone feel and ask first so that they have a choice. It's very important. You should ask for consent. Um, or who, I'm sorry, who should ask for consent? People hooking up for the first time, a couple in a long-term relationship, married couples, or all of the above? Everybody's saying all of the above. And that is correct. Whatever the circumstances of your relationship, consent is a normal and necessary part of sex. And yes, even with married couples, when having a conversation about sex, you can talk about protection, previous experiences, what you like or don't like, or all of the above. All righty. Looks like all of the above. Let's see what happens. That is correct. Yes, you can talk about things like protection, previous experiences, preferences, um, and more through texts or in um, casual situations. Consent is only verbal. Body language and tone don't matter. What do we think on this one? Alrighty. Oh no. <laughs> Let's see. We got false. False is correct, right? When asking someone for their consent, it's important to pay attention to their body language to understand how they're really feeling. It's very important. What clues help you determine if you have someone's consent after you've asked them? Their words, their body language, their tone of voice, or all of the above. Did 
So I'm saying let all, all of the above. Okay. That's correct. It's important to pay attention to all of these clues to make sure that your partner is enthusiastically consenting. Good job, you guys. Let's move on to the next question. If a partner responds, I guess, or if you want to, this could mean, and we should check all that applies. So they might feel pressured or unsure. They don't feel comfortable directly saying no, or they really want to do what you suggested. Okay, so I'm saying all of the above. The first two mostly, so they might feel pressured or unsure. They don't feel comfortable saying no. Any other thoughts? Okay. Oh, all of the above is what I clicked on there and that's incorrect. Your partner's likely trying to tell you that they um, do not want to consent. So that's important to keep that in mind. And Kate brings up a great point. Uh, Kate just typed into the chat box. It's not consent if it's not an enthusiastic yes. Correct. If you've asked for consent, but you aren't sure if your partner is into what you suggested, respect their answer and do something else. Try and convince them to say yes ask them again later or ignore them. What do we think on this one? I'm seeing one, respect their answer. Additional thoughts on this folks? Respect them. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot in favor of the, the first option, respect their answer and do something else. All right. That's correct. If your partner says no, you should accept their answer and move on. And Norma brings up a great point, I think, that leans back to that, um, that crux of communication. Uh, she mentioned talking it out. So respecting what they want, respecting what they're saying, um, being able to communicate, those are certainly all important tools, absolutely. Okay, and it looks like this is the last one here. Once you've both consented, you can still tell your partner if you would like to stop, if you need a break, what you're into and not into, or all of the above. Looks like we got all of the above, all, all. Yes. That is correct. Consent is an ongoing conversation. Our group is rocking the consent quiz here. I'm very Yeah. Excited. Nice job. Oh, we I did put the wrong answer in that one. So we did according to this, we missed one, but that's okay. <laughs> but I think it really helped us learn an important lesson of again what that communication looks like and what that conversation whether it's verbal or the body language or the uncertainty in that conversation may be saying. Um, so I, I certainly think that was helpful for us to experience going through that quiz. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the definition of an importance of consent. Um, I think we touched on this uh, a lot while going through the consent quiz, um, but for our participants, I would like to see from you, um, how do you define consent? So we talked a little bit at the beginning um, about the importance of consent, but how do you define what is consent? Oh, and thank you, Norma, for your feedback. She says she's, it's been great to see the visuals of the What Were You Wearing exhibit that goes with Sexual Assault Awareness Month. We certainly appreciate that, Norma. Um, so for our participants, you can either enter into the chat box or you can unmute yourself. What, what do you understand or define as consent? Saying yes, okay. Okay. 
Other thoughts? Being 100% when the person declares and the person understanding it as such. That's a great point. So understanding your own, understanding your own uh, perspective and being 100% sure that you want to do something. Again, with the enthusiastic yes from Kate, good job. Uh, keep checking with each other or with each new thing you want to do as you're getting busy. Um, sometimes people guess due to body language or appearance. All of this is correct. All of this is correct. Um, as we're looking at information from the National It's On Us campaign and the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, um, one important distinction that I think goes along with all of those definitions that you just gave is consent is about communication and respect. Uh, consent is about the permission that is, that is or is not given for something to happen, uh, whether that is physically, sexually, um, in any activity, right? And so it is about the ongoing communication, the ongoing checking in with people's boundaries and limits in their bodies. Um, it's a clearly expressed agreement to participate in an activity, especially when we're looking at a sexual relationship or any sort of sexual activity. Um, so again, the, the crux and the underlying piece of that definition is it is all about communication. You need to be consistently and constantly checking in with your partner or checking in with the person that you are wanting to engage in that activity with and making sure that you understand um, each other's boundaries, you understand what it is that each other wants. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm seeing a couple comments come in and I do wanna be able to pay some attention to those. Uh, agreement between two people or acceptance between two about what you're doing together, absolutely common. Um, I think the line is blurred due to social media often for the younger generation. It appears to be more so. Um, and I certainly think that's an important conversation. Consent is important for us to know as adults, but it's also important to start having these conversations as we are younger. Um, I know there's a lot of our students that have kids, and these are important topics to have conversations about early on, about respecting your own boundaries, your own limits, your own needs, and also being respectful of others um, and being able to have those conversations in an open and safe way. Um, and so I, I appreciate you bringing that point up, Norma. I think that really lends to the importance of, of this conversation kind of across, across different age groups, across different generations. Um, and in different areas, right? Because it's not always just about sexual activity. It's about um, understanding boundaries and respecting that. Um, Rhonda brings up a great point, not forcing kids to hug others or adults. Um, that's a really an important conversation that I've seen coming up a lot more in these types of discussions is uh, there has been kind of a social norming that's been brought um, brought to the forefront regarding kids um, being forced to show signs of affection, um, whether that's hugging or giving a kiss or um, responding to, to bodily contact that they may, themselves may not be comfortable with. And I think Rhonda brings up a great point in the chat box, um, letting kids be in charge of their own bodies. Absolutely. Letting them identify what they're comfortable with as far as if they don't want to give a hug, if they're not comfortable with receiving a hug. Absolutely. And Charlene, it looked like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I did. Um, I know that this, this past Christmas, um, you know, with all the family together and everything, and, you know, sometimes you get together with family members that you don't see that often. And a niece, my niece, um, she said to my great niece, go give your aunt Charlene a hug. And, you know, I see her maybe once, twice a year and she's, you know, five years old. And she was really shy and kind of timid because she's not around me that often. And I said to my niece, Jessica, I said, she does not need to give me a hug if she does not feel comfortable. And I think that it's really important. You know, I think a lot of people were raised and brought up, you know, even with, you know, with family members that, you know, you have to give them a hug. This is the appropriate thing that you, you're supposed to do that. And I don't think that that is, 
that that is something that we should push on children. I think they should be have to, you know, they need to feel comfortable doing that. And if they don't, they should not, I don't believe that they should be made to do that at all. That's just my and I certainly think this conversation could be a, a whole separate discussion in and of itself. Um, so I want to pay, again, I want to pay attention to the fact that that was brought up because that's a really important part of understanding this concept of consent across the generations. Um, Kate, in our chat box, but my young nephew likes to do the thumbs up instead. That's a great alternative, absolutely. Um, and I think it's not only about um, us on, us identifying, uh, oh, we have a new guest joining us. Um, so it's about us being able to identify those personal boundaries. It's about us being comfortable asking the questions um, as individuals for those that we may have, uh, have close relationships with, be that a loved one, a family, a really close friend. Sometimes we have these innate habits of um, just assuming that they're okay with you giving them a hug or um, touching them on their back or, and, and these are all, I think, instinctive responses that we tend to think, oh, I have this, this relationship with them, they're okay with it. And that might not always be the case because we don't always know what someone's story or what they are going through and experiencing and what their limits are, what their boundaries are without having that conversation. So even with friends that I'm very close to, with family members that I'm very close to, um, and I, I see that they're struggling or I see that they are having a, a difficult time, maybe they're um, expressing their emotion, they're crying, I may want to give them a hug, but I'm always going to have that conversation and ask, is it okay if I give you a hug? I, I want to I want to be able to show my support. I want to be able to offer that, but I want, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. And that can sometimes feel like an awkward conversation to have, um, especially with someone that you may know. And again, you may have that longstanding relationship with, but it's always important to check in. It is always important to have that conversation because people's norms, their opinions, their boundaries change. And, and it's okay for that consent or that, um, that previous um, act that has happened to not be okay the next day because it is up the, to them to determine and identify their limits and their boundaries and what they need at that time. Uh, Norma, I appreciate you. Uh, Norma's jumping into this chat box hard. I love it. Um, I recall trainings for teaching substitutes that said hugs are fine, frontal not acceptable. Um, it's a lot to cover. For some cultures, it's crossing the line. Um, absolutely, there's cross-cultural considerations as well as we're thinking about um, as we're thinking about not only physical touch, but what are people comfortable talking about? What are people uh, comfortable in terms of that physical contact, that physical expression, absolutely. Um, and so I think out of respect um, for cultural, cultural norms, cultural differences, uh, cultural competency, and just out of a general respect for other human beings, it's really important for us to engage in these conversations early and often. Um, so I know, Charlene, that you had some discussion questions that you wanted to open up to the group um, to kind of get the conversation a little more interactive and, and going with that. But I, I just really wanted to highlight as we talked about that definition of consent, um, that this looks different um, for different people and it, it shows itself, um, it shows up in different ways. And we need to think about this in a broader context of it's not just sexual activity. It's any sort of physical contact, physical act, um, and even talking about things that may, um, may be of a sexual nature. Having those conversations and that open communication are going to be critical as we move forward and really try to develop a culture of consent, both on campus and in the community. So I'm going to turn it over to Charlene to ask uh, some of our initial questions um, and get some of the discussion going. Well, and this one kind of piggybacks off of what we were just speaking about. One of my, the questions I have here is, why is building a culture of consent important? Um, you know, I, I have a few points, but I'm interested to see what all of you think. Um, you know, it's, I think people need to decide for themselves what is best for them without outside influence. Um, 
you know, outside interference or influence. Um, I think that it's important for people to feel comfortable in their own skin and feel comfortable saying, no, you know, I don't want you to hug me or, you know, and, and it goes back to the pressures that we can at times feel. Um, Kate just posted on here, I learned from a friend back home to even ask for hugs with your other adult friends. Some people have much harder boundaries than others and we need to respect that. And I think that that's the takeaway is we, like, like she said, we need to respect other people. And like Shannon said, we do not know other people's backgrounds. We do not know their, what they are comfortable with. And it's important to let them make that decision and not, not make them feel that they have to engage in a hug or, you know, that, if they're not comfortable, they should be able to express that themselves. Is there any other, let's see. I would also um, just piggyback off of that, Charlene, and say that, you know, as we're thinking about how people express their boundaries, some people may not be as comfortable openly communicating that they're not comfortable with something. Um, and so it is also really important as we talked about um, in that consent quiz earlier, it's not only the verbal expression of I'm not comfortable with this or no, it is paying attention to the body language. It's paying attention to the verbal and the nonverbal cues that someone might be giving off that show us that they may not be comfortable with the situation that's going on. And, and navigating how we, um, in that situation, are able to respect that boundary um, and hopefully open up some dialogue about it so that there's a better sense of understanding what those limits might be or what those boundaries might be so that you're not crossing them, you're not violating them. Um, I think this could also certainly lead into a conversation about, you know, if we're not directly involved in a situation, um, but as a bystander, we're seeing something where it, it appears someone's clearly uncomfortable or it does not appear that they are giving consent to the other person for something that's going on. Um, that, can be, that can be a slippery slope, that can be very tricky as well, but understanding how to safe and effectively navigate um, being an active bystander is really important to having a better understanding of consent. Um, and that's a whole separate conversation and, and certainly um, I'd be happy to talk about bystander intervention a little bit more in the conversation if people are interested. Um, little bit later on, but I am seeing uh, something in the chat. Uh, if, I guess you would do the same if you want to hold someone's baby, you would ask to hold the baby, right? If mom said no, you'd have to respect it, period. What I'm saying is it always applies sexual or not. Absolutely. Consent is about respecting limits. It's about respecting boundaries and it's about respecting the needs of the other person. 110% regardless of the situation, whether it's sexual activity or human to human interaction. It's about respecting communication, always. Um, so I'm gonna jump into our next question. Um, and I know that Charlene just covered, um, talking about why building a culture of consent is important. Um, what are some of the common myths people have about consent? Oh, yeah, I would say one of the most common myths I hear is that silence is consent, which most definitely is not true. Okay, so silence is consent. Mm. So the lack of a no or the lack of an enthusiastic yes could be taken as a as consent. Yeah. Okay. That, and that's, that's a great point to bring up, Lydia. Um, Again, we talked about the definition of consent earlier. It's that enthusiastic, yes, it is. It, there's a lot of ways in which consent cannot be given um, and silence does not equal consent. Silence does not equal agreeing um, to an activity or agreeing to any, any sort of action. Um, 
again, we have to, we have to think about and respect people's boundaries, and we have to think about there is the potential that person is not comfortable expressing how they feel. They may not feel safe in a situation to express that they're not comfortable with that situation, and and or they may not uh, they may be struggling to find the words to. Uh, fully express what what it is that they are and are not comfortable with. Um, and again, this is really that importance of um, opening up that dialogue and opening up that communication, whether it's with a partner or a friend or whatever it may be, um, to make sure that you understand and respect each other's boundaries. Um, I'm seeing a couple of additional notes in the chat. Uh, you only need to ask the first time that's a common myth, kind of misconception around consent. Um, so I'm scrolling back up because it started scrolling down a little bit. Uh, so many people think they can touch pregnant women's bellies and so many people think being married is permanent consent. Absolutely, and, and again, I think there's, there's cultural, there may be faith-based dynamics, there's a lot of different um, social dynamics that play into some of these myths and, and perceptions around consent. Uh, if you said yes, you can't change your mind the next time. And, and that is 100%. Um, as I was looking through my notes, uh, I think you guys have hit on all of these 150%. Um, some of the common myths that have come up through National Sexual Violence Resource Center, the It's On Us campaign, um, RAIN, which is a national uh, rape prevention education network. They talk about consent is only required once. Asking for consent kills the mood. Consent can be assumed. Um, all of these being uh, pretty common myths that come up, especially as we're talking about sexual activity. Um, Kate just added, you can change your mind when you're actively in intercourse. People think you can't, but you can change your mind 100%. Um, so understanding that just because you may agree to a particular action um, so you may agree to, to kissing someone. That does not mean that you agree to subsequent actions. You may agree to sexual intercourse and then not feel comfortable partway through and, and change your mind. And that is your boundary. That is your boundary and that is your ability and your power to be able to say, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, and, and that is, again, consent is not freestanding one time you you say I'm comfortable with this and then that is the way it is for the rest of the time you are in that relationship or you are engaging with that person. You have the right, you have the privilege, and you have the power to be able to say no, to be able to change your mind, to be able to, um, to not want to engage in that action again. Norma just added, um, recently I heard this one, if you're treating if you're treating women or let's say a date to dinner and drink, there is an expectation. So agreeing to a date is misleading to some. Um, and certainly, again, I think we talked about some of those social norming pieces um, and some of those social um, misperceptions of agreeing to spend time with someone, agreeing to a certain physical or emotional action does not in and of itself explicitly offer consent for other actions to happen, whether that's sexual intercourse or other sexual activity, um, whether that's defining a relationship status, that those do not, um, they are not mutually, th those things are, are not mutually exclusive. You have to have that ongoing conversation. You yes, so outdated, absolutely, absolutely Norma. Um, so having that ongoing conversation about what, what the other is comfortable with, where each other's emotions, where each other's thoughts and boundaries are at, um, are super important. And again, not just in romantic or sexual relationships, but in friendships and familial relationships um, to make sure that you understand um, and are respecting the people around you. Absolutely. Well, and I think that that's why it's so important to build a culture of consent is so that we can eventually get away from this stigma where people 
think that just because you're going out with them, that that is going to lead to something else. And I think that it's important to, especially, you know, to the younger generations now. And if we can get the, if we can instill this in the younger children, and if we can, um, um, what am I trying to say here? Um, if we can just get display to them or, you know, let them see how you're supposed to act and see what actually is proper, then maybe we can get away from this, um, this stigma and how this, this misconception of, okay, I'm going to go out with you. So somebody thinks that immediately something is going to happen because that's just not, it's not right for somebody to even think that. Oh, sorry, I realized I was on mute there. Um, I was just saying absolutely. And I think as we're, um, we're considering what consent looks like, um, you know, there, there's this concept of positive consent and it can look like communicating when you change the type or degree of an activity with phrases like, is this okay? Um, it can be explicitly agreeing to certain activities and that could be either by saying yes or another affirmative statement like I'm open to trying. It can be using physical cues to let the other person know if you're comfortable taking things to a different step or if you're not comfortable. Um, you know, the other piece of that is what it doesn't look like and refusing to acknowledge no is not consent. Assuming that wearing certain clothes or flirting or kissing is an invitation for anything more is not consent. Um, someone being under the legal age of consent as defined by the state someone being incapacitated by alcohol or other substances, um, pressuring someone into sexual activity by using fear or intimidation. I know the Falls hosted a great conversation yesterday on intimate partner and relationship violence, and this was something that came up um, in that conversation as well, um, because it's often a tactic that, that is used in those, um, those types of relationships. And assuming you have permission to engage in a sexual act because you've done it in the past, um, none of these things are, are consent. Um, again, the only thing that is consent is, is communication, and it should happen every time an activity happens. Giving consent that one time for one activity does not mean you are giving consent for any increased or recurring activity to be happening. Um, so one, one good example that I've heard recently of that is agreeing to kiss someone does not give them permission to remove an article of clothing. Um, as we look at sexual activity, having sex with someone in the past does not give them permission to um, reinitiate or re-engage in sexual activity with you now. Um, again, it's all about having those conversations and opening up that communication about what is and is not okay for you, for your body, for your life. Um, Kate added a really great point. I think there's a big misconception if someone says yes to sex when they are drunk that it's okay. Um, it's never okay to have sex with someone who's inebriated, especially when one party is sober, it is taking advantage. Um, again, so when either party are, are under the influence of any sort of substance, whether that be drugs or alcohol, they are not able to give affirmative, active, and appropriate level of consent. That is one of the key things that um, I think Kate Kate hits on in that message is you, you are not able to give a coherent um, and a affirmative response or consent when you are under the influence of substances um, because you are not thinking in a fully clear frame of mind. You are not you are impacted in different ways by different substances. And so I think that's that's certainly one um, big consideration. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that up and kind of reinforcing that, Kate, um, with your comment. Absolutely. Um, Charlene, did we have, I know we're about 15 minutes out from the end of our, uh, our conversation. I think we had one more uh, discussion question that you yeah. want to bring up with the group. So, so the big question is, is what are the benefits of asking for consent? Do you have any ideas out there? Um, 
you know, obviously um, consent is, it shows respect. I think that is probably one of the biggest um, benefits of it. It shows, it shows that you respect the person that you are dating or the person that you love. Um, it shows respect for their body. It shows respect for them as an individual um, and that you're actually equal in the relationship. Norma says, I think the benefits must be a big assurance for the person who gets consent. Exactly. Okay, it says benefits of asking for consent, definitely showing respect, but also you won't be charged with assaulting someone or you won't be known as a bad person who hurts people. And that's very true, yes. And I would, I would offer, um, as far as consent goes, kind of the benefits is you are understanding how to, how to identify respectful boundaries. You're, un, you're understanding how to better communicate your own needs and your own boundaries by asking someone else to be able to create a dialogue around theirs by asking someone for their consent by having the conversation of what they're comfortable with or not comfortable with, that's opening up the communication for you to then share what you are comfortable with and what you are not comfortable with. Um, so again, this is an exercise in effective communication. Um, this is developing a sense of respect and authentic transparency with other people. Um, and really being able to engage in those meaningful relationship and meaningful communication building when you're able to do that. And it might not always feel comfortable. It might feel awkward in the moment, but not asking is not getting consent and not asking is not respecting the other person as, a, as, as far as their mind, body or spirit goes. And so I think that that's definitely a benefit of asking for consent is just understanding how to develop that deeper meaningful communication that is needed for developing and maintaining a healthy relationship. Um, Norma added being honest and being uh, considered an honest person is a huge benefit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any additional thoughts on the benefits of consent or um, any additional questions that you have? Um, we've talked about a few different, uh, few different areas of defining and understanding some of the myths um, and the important considerations of consent. Other questions that folks have um, surrounding consent? And certainly we are happy to stay on um, after the end of the um, the conversation today, if you have questions that you would rather ask in private. Um, being, uh, it, so Norma is asking, is this still part of the new student orientation online? Um, I would actually have to look at the new student orientation template. I know we do have a lot of great resources surrounding um, uh, sexual assault, relationship violence, uh, many of the Title IX issues um, on the website. I, I will have to, to look and see um, what we still have included as part of the new student orientation, but I think that's a great thing to bring up. Um, thank you, Rhonda. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today um, and certainly um, appreciate you engaging in the conversation. Um, Kate, I'm one of the employees working on orientation. Yes, there's a video about consent. Fantastic. Um, and I appreciate that we're building that into the ground level of our student experience. Um, in our campus community experience. I think these are important topics that are across the board, whether you're a new student, you've been with us for five years, you're a faculty or a staff, I think that is um, particularly important to understand and keep perpetuating these conversations around the importance of consent and trying to build a culture of consent and support for healthy relationships and healthy boundaries on campus, absolutely. Any other questions? I know we have a few minutes left. Um, certainly want to open it up. 
And I'm going to do a shameless plug. Um, I'm going to be entering a link into the chat bar. Uh, if you would be able to provide your feedback on today's event, we would love to hear from you, um, what you thought, what you learned, and any ideas for um, additional programs or events you'd like to see similar to this. Um, Norma, I appreciate your message. This is something that needs reminding. Um, absolutely. And while this may be the start of a conversation um, today on consent and understanding those healthy dynamics, it's certainly not the end of the conversation. And I think it's really important that we continue to build this conversation into our day-to-day -day interactions, especially as a campus community um, that can extend into respectful conversations in the classroom and on campus that can um, extend into, again, understanding that active bystander intervention um, and when it's appropriate to intervene and recognize some of those warning signs um, regarding a lack of consent. So I, I greatly appreciate um, all the folks that were able to join us today. Um, again, we'd love to hear your feedback and we will continue through SEC Cares to um, promote different campus and community resources um, surrounding these topics. Um, and we will uh, continue to, to host some of these ongoing conversations. I think it was great getting to interact and uh, hear from some different folks, whether you're a student, a faculty or a staff member um, engaging in this conversation today. Uh, Kate said she'd be interested in a follow-up training on how to respond in those situations, how to speak up for yourself and others. This was great. Absolutely. Um, so I encourage you, Kate, if you can, fill out that, uh, that SurveyMonkey link and let us know um, that you want to hear about uh, more about bystander intervention, more about how to respond in situations. Um, we, we would certainly love to engage not only our campus, but our community resources um, in, in helping to facilitate that conversation. So absolutely, absolutely. Shannon, could you possibly speak to the um, price packs? Oh, yes. Um, so for those members uh, that of the campus community that participated in um, multiple events with us uh, starting last week through this week, um, including today's guest on the Consent Cafe conversation, we are doing five um, hashtag SAMs, standing for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, prize packs. Um, it's going to include some wonderful resource information, um, some great Bigfoot experience swag, um, as well as information on consent, bystander intervention, um, and really just, again, um, highlighting the messages of supporting survivors and understanding the resources during Sexual Assault Awareness Month and year-round. Um, so we are going to do a drawing um, towards the uh, these last few minutes here for those that participated today. Um, I believe everyone that is on the call today is uh, either a faculty, staff, or student. Um, so we will be contacting you. We have a, a numbering system uh, that we're going to use and do a drawing at random, and we will reach out to you if you are one of our prize winners today. All right, and as we wrap up into our last few minutes, any other questions that anybody has? All right, not seeing anything on audio or in the chat. Um, well, again, I just, I wanna reiterate uh, what Charlene said at the very beginning. Thank you so much for uh, being willing to join us today and participate in this conversation. Um, any final words you would wanna offer Charlene? As we um, close the cafe. No, I just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, it was a very insightful conversation, and I hope that um, that you enjoyed it. If you have any further questions, please reach out to um, Shannon or myself, and um, we can get you some further resources um, if need be. Um, but other than that, I really appreciate this was this was enjoyable, and I really appreciate you all joining us and participating. And I've added um, the email to reach myself or Charlene as far as the awareness and prevention education programs. I've added into the chat box. It's awareness at sec.spokane.edu. So we look forward to hearing from you and hopefully um, being able to answer questions or connect you with uh, important campus and community resources. So thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your week and we're getting beautiful weather out. So get out and enjoy some of that sun if you can. All right, have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.